16. So in 15, we did um, your sensory and your motor okay, of the SNS, so somatic, which is what you're looking at over here. Um, for 16, we talk about motor pathways, but we're only going to focus on your autonomic nervous system. So all the viscera in the, like your guts. I made this. We also are going to talk a little bit about memory and learning and sleep. I know you guys don't know what that is anymore. I put this in here just so you have an idea. Just, you know, anytime you can simplify your information, it's the way to do it. Sensory is always going into the CNS. Motor is always coming out. Right? This is what you've already learned. There's upper motor neurons in the CNS. They synapse in the CNS. The axons of the lower motor neurons come out to the periphery. They control your skeletal muscles. That's all the somatic nervous system. Now we're going to move over here. Okay, we're going to talk about um, all the autonomics. So that's the preganglionic neurons and the postganglionic neurons. It's sort of the same thing as upper and lower. Okay, we're just going to say ganglionic. It's okay. The axons are referred to as fibers. So when you hear the post or preganglionic fibers, that's all that means. Okay, so don't get caught up in that. I know it can be a little bit overwhelming. Okay, we got a lot to learn. I know, I think that's fine. Okay, so once again, I know we've already just done this, but somatic nervous system, conscious control, voluntary skeletal muscles, um, this seldom affects your long-term survival, which means if you're paralyzed, you're not going to die. But autonomic nervous system, this is not in your conscious control. These are everything going on underneath the surface that you're not thinking about. So your breathing and your heart beating and your digestion, your hormones... Okay, when these shut down, you're done. Okay. So again, your, ascent, um, your somatic direct control. <coughs> and this is showing your, your upper and lower motor neurons. The ANS is going to be a little bit more complex. These ones start up in the brain, they come down, they synapse, right? And then the lower go into the periphery. Pretty easy. The ANS gets people because it's a little bit tricky. We have the integrative centers. Okay, so that's what you're seeing in purple. Those are the ones that are similar to the upper motor neurons. Okay, but don't get too confused. Just think about it. They still have, these are the preganglionic and post. So it's sort of like one, two. It's like this one has three steps and the other one has two steps. We're going to focus mainly down here. Don't have to worry, but you can see how the preganglionic, they're still all coming out of your central nerve. All the bodies of those are in the central nervous system. The axons come out only. And the bodies of the postganglionic are in the ganglion. Right? That's what the definition of that is. So these ones are all in the periphery. Okay, so the first part, these integrative centers, these ones are usually in the hypothalamus. Okay, so when we say they're comparable to the upper motor neurons, that's because they're the integration centers. Okay, similar to what you see. The motor neurons of the viscera are going to be the pre and the post ganglionic neurons. So the pre ganglionic neurons, they're in the brain stem, they're in the spinal cord. Okay, only their fibers are going to go out, which is what we just saw. Okay, so their axons leave and they synapse on the ganglionic neurons. It's just the neurons in the periphery. That's all that is. Okay, so that's what it's saying. So they come down and they synapse over here. Okay, the ganglionic neurons uh, is the same thing as saying the autonomic ganglia. It's the same thing as saying the postganglionic <coughs> neurons. All the same term. Okay, so it's just different ways to say the same thing. It just means they're outside, uh, sitting out here. Okay, and their axons, again, are called the fibers. These are the ones that go now into your heart, your lungs, your digestive system, your glands, your fat tissue. Within that division, remember we split a third time. And this is the, um, either sympathetic or parasympathetic divisions. Sympathetic is the one where you, um, your heart rate is going, your fight or flight. Okay, so your breathing increases, your blood is pumping. Right now, none of you have your sympathetic division kicked on. So most of the time, your parasympathetic division is in control. Okay, this is where you have a lower uh, metabolic rate, 
Um, you might be digesting. You're at rest. Okay, so that's most of the time. Most of you are not running around crazy. No, you are stressed. But unless you have a car accident, um, some stressful news, or you're physically working out, you're usually in your parasympathetic is going to be in control for the most part. Okay, they're always on and off, but this is the main <coughs> control. Okay, they can work separately, independently of one another. Some structures only have sympathetic or parasympathetic innervation, and they don't have both. Then there's a lot of things that have both. We call that dual innervation. So your heart is going to have both. Okay, so they work together. Um, usually they have opposite effects to bring your body, again, like always, in balance. <coughs> So one is speeding you up, and the other one is trying to slow you back down. We're going to start with the sympathetic first, okay? So this is your fight or your flight. So it's your preganglionic fibers from thoracic and lumbar. So you got to go all the way back to your spinal cord. Okay, so remember, this was cervical. The thoracic, down here was lumbar, and then sacral. Okay, so we're actually going from the top of this to L2. <coughs> okay, so this whole section. We go here and here, the very top and the very bottom, that's going to be parasympathetic. So think of the middle chunk like the sympathetic. Okay. Your preganglionic fibers, so those red ones that are coming out of the spinal cord, they're short. They're short because they're going to synapse in ganglion, which are right next to the spinal cord. Okay, so they don't have that very far to go. The postganglionic fibers are the ones that are innervating all throughout the body, and they're very long. So this one is preparing you for some sort of crisis, activity, A and P test. <laughs> okay. Here's your responses. You have heightened mental alertness. Your heart rate, your metabolic rate increases. Um, your metabolic rate, when it says it increases, it means your body, your liver, and your muscles are going to start metabolizing your glycogen reserves. They're chopping it up and they're making glucose. You have glucose for energy running through your bloodstream, getting to all your muscles so you can make ATP. You shut down your digestive and your, your urinary functions. Okay, so you're not worried about eating or going to the bathroom because you're just trying to survive. Your respiratory tract is going to open up so you can get more oxygen, so you can get um, more ATP. Okay. And of course, your heart rate and your blood pressure speed up, and then your sweat glands can be activated. Okay. The parasympathetic, complete opposite. Um, your preganglionic fibers in this one, they start in the brain stem, okay, or so again up here, or all the way down here in the sacral. These ones, um, they synapse close to their target organs. So in this case, the preganglionic fibers are very long. They come out all the way. They're going to synapse out here. And then the postganglionic fibers are short. Okay, so this one is when you're just chilling out. This is what some of you look like right now. Okay. This just shows you how they're coming off the spinal cord. Okay, so the parasympathetic at the top and at the bottom and then in the center is all sympathetic. <laughs> the responses low metabolic rate your heart rate goes down your blood pressure should be down um, you're going to be digesting food so your salivary glands are working your digestive tract is moving okay, so your blood is sort of shunted away from your muscles and your extremities to your internal organs that are doing things like digestion so it's not a great idea to go eat a big meal and tell your body, okay, we need blood in the stomach and the intestines, and then say, hey, I'm going to go for a run. And then you've got to shunt all your blood out, right, to your muscles, and now you have cramps. Okay. This also makes you go to the bathroom. You're relaxed. You have time. There's another division, the enteric nervous system, that's neither... Uh, sympathetic or parasympathetic. It's its own little entity. Okay? There's a hundred million neurons, that's a lot, in your digestive tract. Okay? So this means that um, you know, all those activities going on down there are really highly innervated. Um, why are there so many neurons in your digestive tract? That's something to really think about. So 
whenever you're eating food, just to think about it, it really does affect your whole entire body. Your brain is linked right into everything you're eating. Um, can you control that with your parasympathetic and sympathetic? Yes. Okay, but it doesn't need it to just do its thing. All right. This is a nice, easy one. What oh. part of your nervous system when you're stressed out? Emergency. I'm chased by a lion. I keep my fingers crossed the entire class for this one. People are looking up it in their notes. It's not going to help you. It's too late. Yes. Yeah. So, this is your sympathetic. This is the one we just talked about. We showed the big eyeballs. Listening skills help. <laughs> All right, so now we're just going to focus on the sympathetic. This gets a little heavy in the beginning. Try to simplify it. Okay, so we're talking first about your preganglionic neurons. So these are the ones you had the integrative centers. These are coming out of the spinal cord. They're the red ones. Okay, this would be like the first set coming out. Again, they're coming down your thoracic and then the first two of your lumbar. Okay, the ganglionic neurons are going to be right along them. Okay, so right near the vertebral column. So they're out here. They're in the periphery. Okay. The cell bodies of your preganglionic neurons are going to be in the lateral gray horns. So remember our little butterfly in the spinal cord? You had the anterior and the lateral. Those were everything for motor. Remember, it's the one in the center, the lateral. That was all viscera. Okay. Then they go out the ventral roots. Remember the whole root system? So there's a picture. Yay, there is. Okay, so these are ventral, these are dorsal. I don't like how your book drew this because it looks like, remember this should look like the butt, it's the posterior, and this should have the, the grooves, the fissure in it. So they drew it a little bit, which I don't like that, but keep in mind. There's your, all your sensory going in and all your motor coming back out. Okay, so we're right here in the lateral part. That's where your great horns. And you can see this, so remember, these are the ones where um, your preganglionic are short because they come right out and they synapse right here, right next to your spinal column. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So, whenever we have this, we're going to split this. We're in the sympathetic division. Okay, there's three sets of these ganglionic neurons. The one you're most familiar with is this one right here. It comes right outside the spinal cord and looks like this. Like little dots on either side. I know you guys in the back can't see that, but okay. those are the ones you're used to seeing and thinking of on all the pictures. Those are your chain ganglia. Okay, so the sympathetic chain. Everything coming out of your spinal cord goes through those. Okay, the ones that actually synapse there are actually called the chain ganglia. Okay, we say they're paired because they're on e they're on both sides of your spinal column, okay, going all the way down. Okay. They're the ones that look like the little beads going down the sides. Okay. They're going to hit uh, visceral effectors in your thoracic cavity. What are the two organs, big things in your thoracic cavity? Heart and lungs, yeah, so you guys are on it on that one. It's also going to be um, your head, your body wall, and your limbs, okay, so all the sweat glands and all the smooth muscle in there. The collateral ganglia. They come out, right, the spinal cord. They go through the chain ganglia, and there's three of them. Okay? And they are going to be actually in front of the spinal cord, or your spinal column. So they're sitting out here like this. Okay, so there's three of those. Okay. Those are all for your abdominal pelvic cavity, so all the organs in here. Okay? 
the suprarenal medulla. Okay, these ones are paired because they're going to your adrenal glands. They're going actually to the very center of your adrenal glands. These are the freaky ones. They do some weird stuff. Okay, so that's all they do is they come out through the chain, they go through the collateral, and then they go down to the center of your adrenal glands. Okay, they actually will secrete hormones. So it's like a neurohormone. So when we look at these, all of these have short preganglionic fibers because they're going right here or right here. The only thing that's a little weird is that the suprarenal medulla, okay, they have a long preganglionic fibers that come down, which we'll see. Okay. So here's the three locations. So sympathetic chain, it looks like a chain of little beads. Okay, so those are the ones on either side of your column. And again, this is what they innervate. The collateral, they sit in front of the vertebrae. There's three of them. Okay, and then these ones, the modified. Okay, and they actually secrete hormones. So those are pretty funky. Here's your sympathetic chain ganglia. They do two different things, and we already learned this in chapter 13. So this is review. Great. Okay, they both come out of the lateral because we're in viscera. Coming out of the lateral, they're going to come through the ventral horns, right? They go through the spinal nerve, which is right here. And it's called a spinal nerve because also the sensory information is in there. They come out of the white ramus. Why is it white? Myelinated, yeah. It, these are all axons and they're myelinated. So these ones that are coming through in this section here and here, they all have white rhini coming out. We're going to see that's not true for some of the sections. Okay. They can synapse in that ganglia. This is where this little bead right here is called the, that's the chain ganglia, right? So there's a second, your postganglionic nerve is in there. It synapses on that cell body. If that one just keeps going, okay, so it goes down the other way, it's going to go into um, your thoracic cavity. So those are the ones going through your, we call it a sympathetic nerve, and it's going to the heart and lungs. Okay, so these ones, sympathetic nerves. You can do something else. We have them split on the sides of the screen, but it's happening all in one side on, on both sides together. This one is going to do something. It comes out, the ventral goes through the spinal nerve, goes through the light ramus, synapses in the ganglion like it's supposed to, but now the postganglionic neuron is going to do something funky. It's not going to go down through the sympathetic nerve. It's going to go back up through the gray ramus. This is what the gray ramus is. So this is only your postganglionic axon. Comes up. It's going to go back into your spinal nerve, and your spinal nerve is going to direct it where to go. Okay, so those are the ones that go through the body wall, the head, the limbs, all the glands. Okay, so you see the difference? So if it goes in here, and it goes straight down through the sympathetic nerve, that's the one that's going to your heart and your lungs. Okay, if it goes back up through the gray ramus, back up through the spinal nerve, it's going to innervate your head, your, um, your chest, your limbs, all your glands. Okay? So, and these are all the chain ganglia. Okay. The collateral ganglia... They go through the same exact pathway. So they're going to come through, right? They're coming out the lateral. They go through the ventral, through the spinal nerve, through the white ramus, through the chain ganglion. Keep going. They don't synapse. They keep going. And then they extend right here to the collateral ganglion. That's where they're going to synapse to their post-ganglionic nerve. Okay? And then those ones will innervate your abdominal pelvic organs. This is not so bad. Okay, so here's the weird one, the suprarenal medulla. So this one is the long one. All the rest of them, I know that this one kind of looks long, but it's not that long. This thing is going to go all the way, all over to all the organs. So these ones, your preganglionic, are short. But if you look at this one, this is the freaky one where the preganglionic is very long. This come out of the spinal cord, go through all of that, through the chain, through the collateral, and then all the way down to your adrenal glands, which sit on top of your kidneys. Okay, so the pre is really long, and the post is super short. You can see a little tiny. Okay. How do we feel about that? Good. Moderately good. Okay. So, when we're looking at the ventral roots of T1 to L2, okay, they all have a white ramus. Okay. 
That's again your myelinated preganglionic fibers all coming out of the ventral roots. That's easy. Okay. They can synapse on that chain ganglia, they can keep going and synapse in the collateral, or they can keep going and synapse in your adrenal medulla. Okay. With the sympathetic division, what we find is you can have one preganglionic fiber synapse, it can come in and split and go to several different ganglion. So one coming out might split into a bunch of peripheral nerves, okay, or synapse, I should say, on a bunch of different nerves. Okay, so it's extensive. It's not very specific. It can go all over the place. So all these coming down here, all these little beads, those are your sympathetic chain ganglion. Okay, so we feel comfortable with that? These ones here all have a white ramus. Okay, because it's coming right off of the spinal cord and into this part. Okay. These ones up here and down here do not have a white ramus. Okay, they all have gray. These ones, because they actually just extend off of here, these are just collaterals sort of coming off of the axons, okay, they don't have a white ramus on the top and the bottom. Okay. This is just another picture showing you the same thing. Any questions on this? Anything something you can describe all this? Yeah. What is the length of the ramus? Length of the what? Right here? The length of them? Yeah. You're saying something about something being short and long. It's not um so not the rami, but the post versus the preganglionic fibers. Okay, so it's different in when we're talking about um, these ones, and we're going to see when we get to the next section, it's going to be the reverse. When we get to the parasympathetic, you're going to see short and then long. These ones are, are you're going to see long and then short. These ones are short and then long. Okay. So, your postganglionic fibers, these are controlling your visceral effectors. Okay, so, again, this is this blue one. Visceral is coming through. Here's your spinal nerve. Um, these are the ones that enter. They come down through the white ramus, which is what you see here. They synapse. Okay, it's the postganglionic that come back up through the gray ramus. Back up through the spinal nerve. If they go down, again, that's going to be a sympathetic nerve. And it goes to the heart or the lungs. Everything else is going to go to the head, the neck, the limbs, the body wall. Feel pretty good about that? Okay. This is their sympathetic nerves. Okay, so they're coming out and um, they're going to go to your heart and your lung. So again, only T1 through L2 have a white rami. Every other one has a gray, but it's all of these ones up here. They just they come out through the white ramus, but then they just extend up or they extend down. Okay, the collateral ganglia again. These are the ones that um, they go through the chain ganglia and they keep going. Okay, so they synapse in the collateral ganglia. They don't synapse in the chain. We call these the splanchic nerves. Okay, so that's all the preganglionic fibers that are coming out through the chain and they're going through the collateral. They're in the dorsal wall of your abdominal cavity. Okay, so the, the back of it. Okay, so here they are. Here, here, and here. Here's the actual ganglion. One, two, three. There's only three of them. These are the nerves. So your collateral ganglia, these ones, um, the pre come down, they go all the way out there. Okay, they synapse there, then you have your postganglionic. Those are the ones that are going to innervate um, all your organs that you think of in your abdominal pelvic. Their general function is going to be to reduce blood flow. Okay, so 
This is not something you want to do long term, but if you're running for your life from the lion that's going to eat you, okay, you're not worried again about digesting your lunch. You've got to get blood because you need oxygen and energy to your muscles. So there's three of these. So the celiac and the superior mesenteric ganglion, these are from the inferior thoracic segments. Okay, the preganglionic fibers um, from the lumbar segments at the bottom, that's the inferior mesenteric ganglion. Okay, so celiac. And think of the ganglion like these little balls. Here's the superior and then here's the inferior. So the celiac ganglion. Um, these are named after major arteries. They're following major arteries. They run right with them. Okay, so it's <coughs> named after the celiac trunk, so uh, which would supply blood to your stomach, your spleen, and your liver. Okay, all that ganglion is, it's gray matter. What's gray matter? It's cell bodies. So it's all these neuron cell bodies sitting in there. Okay, the fibers will innervate your stomach, your liver, your gallbladder, your pancreas, and your spleen. So a lot of your digestive areas. The superior mesenteric region, um, that one is basically your small intestine and the majority, two-thirds of your large intestine. Okay, so again, it's following your superior mesenteric artery, which you're going to learn all the arteries and veins in AMP2. The inferior is basically the rest of your small intestine and then all your urinary and reproductive organs. So now we're down to the very last one, uh, the freaky one, the suprarenal medulli. Okay, so your preganglionic fibers have to innervate both the chain and the collateral and then come back out. Okay. They don't synapse till they're all the way down in the actual adrenal glands, in the center of it. Okay, where do they synapse? On neuroendocrine cells. Okay, so very different. They actually secrete a hormone. The rest of them just fire to another neuron, right? And then they talk to whatever organ you're going to talk to. These ones actually secrete a hormone. So either epinephrine or norepinephrine, which is adrenaline and noradrenaline. This is different than everything else we've seen in your sympathetic ganglion. Because cells that are not innervated can actually be affected by this one because it's a hormone. Right, so as long as you have the receptor for adrenaline, you're going to have the effect. Okay. It's also going to go into the bloodstream. Hormones last longer. It takes longer to break them down. They get circulated throughout. Right. So here's this one. So they come out, go through the collaterals, and then all... This is still the preganglionic fiber. See how long it is? All the way down. Just on top of the kidney. Okay. Well, I put a lot of questions in here. Okay. So which part carries your preganglionic fibers to the sympathetic chain ganglion? Did it quit on you? Mine's not letting me enter. Mine's not letting me enter either. Well, we're going to throw this one out. Sorry. So many free points. You guys got to earn them now. But I have to end it. I'll try one more time to see if it'll just go. But if, the only way to fix it is for you to see the answer. I can, but it's going to show you the answer. Thank you.
get started. <laughs> Just try it and see if it works. Nope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jumping the gun over there, Michael. I'm not worried. You know, last night I had one. I thought that it would be up for a while. More startling is people are taking time to answer this one. It can have special factors or specific, or it can your whole body can go under um, sort of crisis mode. So that would be sort of what we call sympathetic activation. That's going to be since you guys don't get chased by tigers and lions, most of you. Um, that's going to be something like a car accident where you know your whole body at once feels this and everything slows down. Okay, so if you have increased alertness, you feel on edge. Um, you could have insensitivity to pain. You might get an accident and not even know you're hurt yet. Your breathing changes. Um, you're tense up. And you're mobilizing all your energy. So your whole body at once is ready. Okay. The specific neurotransmitters. We're going to learn neurotransmitters for the parasympathetic as well. It's a little bit more complex than the sympathetic. Okay, so... Um, we have some of them that release acetylcholine. Okay, those are the ones that are we call cholinergic, which we've actually already learned. Those are always excitatory. They're always going to sort of turn on our ganglionic neurons. Okay. The ganglionic neurons are the ones that um, can do acetylcholine or norepinephrine. So the first one's coming down, acetylcholine. The second one, the post, can be norepinephrine or acetylcholine. Okay, most of them are going to release norepinephrine. Okay. This gets broken down pretty quickly um, right there in the synapse by monoamine oxidase or catechol O methyltransferase. There's also some enzymes in the tissues. If this were to get out a little bit, it's going to break down. Sometimes it releases acetylcholine. Okay, this is like in um, the sweat glands, blood vessels. Okay, so and it can dilate your blood vessels. Okay, so acetylcholine makes them larger in the sympathetic. So remember, we're trying to pump the blood. It depends on different areas. So um, when you're in your sympathetic division, sometimes we want to constrict to keep blood pressure up, and then we want to dilate other areas to get the blood to those, like your muscles. You can also have nitric oxide as a um, neurotransmitter. We call these the nitrozydergic <laughs> synapses. So, yes. These um, are in the smooth muscle of your vessels. So, it's vasodilation. So, this was actually, of course, used for people that had heart problems. This was first designed by Agra for, they gave it to a lot of old people that were having heart problems. And what do you know? And it did improve their lifestyle. So it opened up a lot of vessels, but specifically, it turns out you have these in the penis. So it became vasodilated for six to eight hours. So lots of blood. What do you know? Now we have Viagra. So, and this is poor dog. So that's how that works. So the ganglionic neurons, um, they have a different structure. Okay, so we're talking, when we say ganglionic, we mean the post. Okay, so these are the ones coming out. Um, whenever they're coming at the bottom, when we talk about our typical neuron, remember we had like the little dendrites coming out, this is the cell body, axon, and then we had this little junction. 
This one is different. Okay? It doesn't look like this at the bottom. It has a really different structure. Okay? Whenever it comes off of that bottom half, the telodendra, okay, they have these little tiny knobs. And that's what, this is actually, I drew a picture of this one right here. This is being your axon. So when it splits, instead of having that like, plate like it did for at the muscles, you're going to see it split into all these strings <coughs> that looks like beads. Okay, and this is a close-up. The beads are full of neurotransmitter vesicles. Okay, so they're just loaded up. We call these the sympathetic varicosities, these strings of beads. Okay, and these are going to be on smooth muscle. Okay, so again, this is not your skeletal muscle. This is your smooth muscle. So, and they're going to be right near your effector cells. They're not usually within them. They're sort of layering them. Okay, so there's no postsynaptic membranes on smooth tissue. Um, there's going to be receptors on the target cells. Okay. So what kind of receptors do we have? Um, alpha and beta. And then we've got different divisions of alpha and beta. These can both um, sort of react to norepinephrine, but alpha will react much more potently than the beta will. These are G protein receptors, so you have to reach back in your brains to biology 1441 to remember, what the heck is a G protein receptor? Uh, it binds, it activates the G protein, which sets off a cascade of second messengers. So all a second messenger is, it's um, a molecule in the pathway that is not a protein. So calcium is a second messenger, um, cyclic AMP is a second messenger. So alpha-1 and alpha-2. Alpha-1 is the more common of the two. Okay. When it becomes activated okay, and it sets off its cascade, <coughs> it releases calcium into the cytosol. Okay, so it goes through this pathway and there's a whole reserve of calcium. It's very high in your endoplasmic reticulum. It's very low concentration in the cytoplasm. So all it has to do is open up those ion gates and out comes all this calcium. Okay. This would excite the target cell. Alpha-2 will lower what we call cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is another one that turns a pathway on. Okay, so it's the activated pathway. If you lower the activated pathway, you'll inhibit that target cell. Okay, so it's like shutting it off, shutting off the on signal. Okay. These work together to sort of um, coordinate your sympathetic and parasympathetic activities. So sometimes you want the sympathetic going, and sometimes you want to shut it down. This is where alpha-2 would come in and say, okay, we need to keep our sympathetic down. Parasympathetic is working now. Beta, so there's beta 1, 2, 3. Um, these are in your skeletal muscles, your heart, your lung, your liver. So metabolic changes in whatever that target cell is. So this one is increasing cyclical AMP. Does anyone remember cyclical AMP? Back in the day, your friend? Anybody remember the enzyme? Uh, yeah, phosphodiesterase turns it off. Adenocyclase makes it impressive. Okay. Beta 1 increases your metabolic activity. Uh, beta 2, relaxation of your smooth muscles along your respiratory tract. Okay. And beta 3 leads to lipolysis, everybody's favorite, breaking down your fat cells. How do we turn these things on? You can turn on one and two. We'd all be running around like perfect. Okay, so that was all sympathetic division. So now we're gonna switch gears and talk about your parasympathetics, so rest and digest. The preganglionic neurons, so the first ones so are in your brain stem, again, and then all the way down here in the sacral segment. The mesencephalon, the pons, and the medulla. Those that's your brain stem. Those are the ones that have the autonomic nuclei. Okay? They're associated with the cranial nerves. Okay? The sacral segments um, are in the lateral gray horns, so um, in your spinal cord, so S2 to S4. What about the postganglionic or the ganglionic? These are the ones in the peripheral. So they're either terminal, they're near the target organ, okay? and there's usually pairs of them. Sometimes these things fuse together. Your bodies can do weird stuff. Or they can be intramural, and this is when they're actually embedded into the, the tissue. 
here's um, your preganglionic at the top with your cranial nerves, and then at the bottom they form what we call pelvic nerves. Okay, we're going to see how, again, just like we had in the sympathetic, we had all those different divisions, we're going to have different sets of ganglion. So ciliary, uh, pterygo palatine, your submandibular, your otic, intramural, and at the top, and then intramural at the bottom. And again, if you know your cranial nerves, this will be easy. Okay. Your sympathetic um, will open your pupils, let more light in, so you're more visual and you can see. This is the opposite for parasympathetic. It shrinks your pupils. Okay, so this is when you're tired, your pupils are coming down, you're not as visually aware. So you're going to change um, what hormones you're screening, you're going to be digesting, you're slow down your blood flow, um, you go to the bathroom, heart rate goes down. So organizing your parasympathetic. This isn't as bad as it looks. It's a lot of information, but we've already learned this, so it's good news. The cranial nerves that we're going to talk about, the oculomotor, okay, so those eyeballs, your facial, glossopharyngeal, and your vagus nerve. Vagus is the rock star. You're going to see why. Okay, these are the ganglia that I just showed you. Okay. So, in this case, the preganglionic fibers are very long, so they have to go all the way out into these ganglia. Okay, remember in the sympathetic, it was the opposite. Okay, now the posts are the short ones. Okay, so they're very close to wherever their targets are. Here's your cilia for the eyeball. Submandibular and your eyes both will do salivary glands. Uh, Pterygoid palatine, your tear glands, so the lacrimal will produce tears for your eye. Vagus. It's just like Vegas. It does everything. So hard, long, we're going to see it. In the next one. 75%, okay, that's a lot, of all your parasympathetic outflow goes through your vagus nerve. This is one you do not want to mess with. Okay. So this is going to be in your neck, your thoracic, your abdominal pelvic, um, all the way down through your large intestine, okay, and, and it actually intermingles with your sympathetic division and forms these plexuses. Okay, so here it is. Look at this guy. I got one eyeball. He's like, yeah, I got all of these to take care of. Okay, so he does everything. At the bottom, in the sago segment, that's where we have our pelvic nerves. Um, these ones, whenever the preganglionic fibers are coming out, um, they're not going to join up with the spinal nerves. Instead, they're going to form their own pelvic nerves. Just like we had sort of sympathetic nerves at the top and the thoracic, we're going to see pelvic nerves down here at the bottom. Okay, so these are the ones that are going to your kidney, your bladder, um, your reproductive organs. So that's all for the parasympathetic. All we got to tell you, all of that that we went through with sympathetic, the parasympathetic is tinier. And this is the one that's doing all the work. Okay, now we're all the way on to receptors. Okay. Every single neuron in the parasympathetic division releases one type of neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. Okay, remember sympathetic had a couple different ones. This one, just acetylcholine. You can remember that, right? That's easy. Just acetylcholine. So, this is released at um, your smooth muscle and at glands. It's short lived and it's localized, which means is rapidly inactivated by acetylcholinesterase, um, which we've already talked about. The receptors for this, okay, nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. Nicotinic and muscarinic, um, they're both named for the toxic poisons which set them off. Okay. Sort of what happens sometimes when we discover things. But so this one is for nicotine, um, this one is for muscarine, which is in a mushroom. But the nicotine, um, these are ones are on the surface of your ganglionic cells, so sympathetic and parasympathetic. Okay, it's um, excitatory okay, for that or for a muscle fiber. Muscarinic, um, these are cholinergic at your neuromuscular uh, or your glands for parasympathetic. And there's a few cholinergic for your sympathetic. They're G-protein receptors. Okay, these ones last a little bit longer than the nicotinic receptors. Um, and they can excite or inhibit. 
These ones are just exciting. So, nicotine uh, is obviously what you find in tobacco products. This is what binds to nicotinic receptors, which um, in, now we know acetylcholine will do this, right? But in the correct amounts. But when you have nicotine actually bind to this, um, it doesn't take much before you can get very sick. Okay, so it can target again your autonomic ganglia and then also your skeletal neuromuscular junction. So these can affect your sympathetic as well. Okay. If you ingest 50 milligrams or you absorb it through your skin, okay, you're going to get very sick. And if you've had the pleasure of hanging out with high school boys, which probably all of us have at one point, you've probably seen this. Okay. So whenever guys first try to dip or chew, this is what happens. They get poisoned from nicotine because it goes so fast into their bloodstream. Vomiting, diarrhea, high blood pressure, very nauseous, um, sweating, saliva going. I've never seen convulsions, but just about everything else. May result in coma or death. So uh, they look very cool trying it, and they look even cooler when they're puking in the corner. <laughs> Um, the muscarin, these ones are the ones, this is actually a compound found in mushrooms. So again, that's what it's named for. That's not what happens in your body. But this one will target your parasympathetic muscular or glandular junctions. Same kind of symptoms. Make you pretty sick. And these are the ones that are used in sweat lodges. So they give you like a high. But hey, if you don't do it right, you'll die. So, which actually happened, I think, last year. Does anyone remember that? Let's hope this works. All the synapses, all the neuroaffective junctions, pre and post in your parasympathetic division. It's a neurotransmitter. It's too long. Okay. So for your rewrite, I don't know if it was like five minutes ago. I was like, that's easy, right? We can remember that, right? Every single thing is acetylcholine. Just trying to forewarn you. All right. Dual innervation. So we're done with sympathetic, we're done with parasympathetic. Now we're going to see what happens when you have both working together. Okay, so lots of your vital organs, they're going to get instructions from both. Usually at the same time, like I said, it's going to be a balance between one is ramping it up and the other one is ramping it down. Sometimes they can be complementary, sometimes they can be separate. This is more rare. Your parasympathetic, these are the ones, the postganglionic. Okay? It will go through your cranial nerves to the different destinations. Your sympathetic innervation um, will reach the same structures, but it will go through the cervical ganglia, the superior okay, of your sympathetic, so at the top. We have these nerve networks. So this is when we're going to, the autonomic plexuses. This is when we're mixing them together. Okay, so it's both the post for your sympathetic and the pre from your parasympathetic. Okay? These, this is what's like one thing I hope you're learning in this class because it's brutal in here. If you don't pay attention to one little word, one little prefix or suffix of a word, you miss the question, right? You have to pay attention to all these tiny details. The hard part for you is learning what is to pay attention to and what not to. In this class, don't worry. Pay attention to everything. 
So these these fibers are all traveling together. They're going to go right along with your vessels. Okay, so they're all following the sort of same pathway together. Okay, uh, this just shows you some of the plexuses. There's one in your heart, one in your lungs. You have um, celiac, the hypogastric. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you get the idea. So these sort of work together to, again, balance you in the body. Okay. You have a background, just like you have background muscle tone, you have a background of autonomic tone. Okay, that does not mean your stomach is flexing in there and working out. Um, it's a little bit different. It just means that there's some baseline activity going on. So if a nerve is just turned off, the only thing you can do is turn on. Okay, so, but if it has a certain level of background, you can inhibit it or turn it on. Okay, so having that tone, that little bit of turned on, whether it's both sympathetic or parasympathetic, helps you really fine tune the system. Okay, so you can balance it very quickly. Okay, so wherever we have dual innervation, we usually have opposing effects, okay, of, again, like we've been saying. So. This is important there. It's also important when you only have one system, and we're going to see why. It's just for added control. But let's look when you have the two divisions together and dual innervation, why autonomic tone is important, and when they're doing opposing effects. Um, if you have your parasympathetic division and it's releasing acetylcholine, the postganglionic fibers are slowing down your heart. Your sympathetic division is releasing norepinephrine, okay, and it's accelerating your heart rate. Okay, so you're finding this sort of back and forth. Okay, continuously this is being released, both of them. Speed up, hold on, speed up. Okay, so you find this sort of balance. Okay. Under resting conditions, your parasympathetic is the one that is obviously right now where you're sitting at, right? If we had a car crash through the center of the building right now, I bet you everybody's heart rate would go up a little bit. So a crisis, now suddenly we're able to drop down our parasympathetic and increase sympathetic very rapidly. And we've already got it somewhat turned on, so now we can just ramp it up really fast. Okay. What about when you don't have dual innervation? Now we just have just one or the other. Okay, so uh, we know that when you dilate your blood vessels, you increase your blood flow. Or if you constrict your vessel, you reduce your blood flow. Okay, so those are the basics. Your sympathetic postganglionic fibers, okay, so those accents are releasing norepinephrine, and your smooth muscle cells and your, all your peripheral vessels, it keeps those muscles partially contracted. Okay, if you need to increase the blood flow, you can do so very rapidly. Okay, so you can drop your norepinephrine release okay, and then stimulate your sympathetic cholinergic fibers. So then the smooth muscle relaxes. Okay, and then your vessels can dilate and the blood flow can increase. So you can sort of work both ways. So you can work your vessels and the smooth muscle around it all at the same time. So why is this so important? It just gives you much more precise control over your body. And you're not even aware. Okay. We're going to briefly talk about visceral reflexes, just like you have um, the reflexes in your skeletal system. You also have them in your viscera. Okay, so they're automatic responses. Uh, you can definitely modify these through higher centers of the brain, like the hypothalamus. Okay, the consensual light reflex, constrict your pupils, that's the parasympathetic. Um, pupillary, and everything at large, that's the sympathetic. Your emotional state, this is a good one for you. Sexual arousal, your pupils dilate. So, you can look over at your partner and check it out and see if your moves are working. <laughs> if they're not, I suggest you just tell them about pupillary reflex and then watch the pupils dilate, because that'll be a turn on. There's the partner. You'll be like, did she just say sympathetic innervation? <laughs> if you're not feeling well, you're queasy, you're nauseated, they constrict. So you can look at somebody's eyes and see if they're lying to you, if they're sick or not. Um, if you're on drugs, your people are like, yeah. Yeah, you don't have any irises. So you can see if somebody's on something, if they're like, how's it going? <laughs> How are you doing? I'm fine. <laughs> so lots you can see by somebody's eyes. 
Okay. You're all going to be checking it out later. Mm. Okay, so the ARC is the same that you had in your skeletal muscles. You have a receptor, um, you have a sensory neuron, you have a processing center, and then you always have two motor neurons. It's always, 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 always polysynaptic. Did I mention that? Always? I never say always. I'm saying always. Always polysynaptic. Okay, so skeletal muscle can be mono or poly. These ones are always polysynaptic. Okay. There's two different types, a long uh, and a short reflex. Okay, so the long reflex uh, are the ones that usually coordinate an organ, an entire organ. So you have your sensory neurons come in, give you the information, and then your ANS carries it out. The short reflexes actually bypass your central nervous system. Okay, so they have your sensory neuron, they have interneurons that are in the autonomic ganglia. Okay, so these ones are in the peripheral, sort of. And then the motor command will be go by the postganglionic fibers, and then usually just one part of that organ is going to be affected. Okay. So, stimulus, this is your long reflex. This would be your short reflex. So see how this one comes all the way into the spinal cord? And then this one just comes straight into the ganglion back out. So again, um, long reflexes usually for entire organs. Short ones, just one part of it. So something you might see in your digestive tract for coordinating different parts. And you're moving food along. And waste. Okay, switching gears. So we feel good about all that stuff? Any questions? Okay. Last part of this is your higher order functions. So memory and learning. Uh, these require your cortex, your cerebral cortex. We need conscious and unconscious information. Okay, and here's the thing, we really just don't know very much about any of this. It is my lifelong goal to somehow figure out how to make you guys be able to memorize your entire A and P book in five weeks. If I can only do it. I'd love to. Um, so you have fact memories. Specific. That would be great, right? If I could teach you how to memorize quickly, it's have to be a snap. Skill memories are your motor behaviors. Okay, so these ones you need to do um, over and over and over unconsciously, repetition, okay, and they get stored. Okay. Your basal nuclei, your cerebral cortex, and your cerebellum are all involved in these. Your short term memories, that's what you have right now about AMP. Okay. You can recall this information pretty quickly, but they do not last long. If I ask you next week about muscles, I bet you, you probably will not know. <laughs> Long-term memories, these are the ones that um, you've taken from short-term and convert to long-term. So by the time that you get to PT school or nursing or wherever you're going, let's hope that you're converting these into long-term memories. Okay. You can have long-term memories that fade. Um, they're called secondary memories. These would be things maybe they happened to you a long time ago and the story seems to change when you're at home telling the story and your mom's like, that's not what happened. And then your sibling's like, this is what happened. And sort of change it. Here's your memories. You will have this forever. You'll never forget Spot, your favorite dog. Okay. So, I don't worry about this. Just going to show you short-term, secondary, tertiary. So they go in order. Okay, so what's involved in memory? And if I were you, I would want to know this. Because if I were you, I would want to increase my memory as much as possible. And we know your limbic system is involved. It's your emotions. So your amygdala, your hippocampus, nucleus, um, basialis, and your cerebral cortex. Okay, so let's talk about your limbic system. Um, we know it's important. We don't know really why. Okay, so if you have damage to these areas, we know that you might not be able to ever convert short-term into long-term memories. Okay, um, your long-term memories might be okay to remain intact. There's a movie, I think, uh, what is it? There's that one, and then there's 50 First Dates. Either way, they both mess up your memory a lot. Okay, so if you have never seen those movies, you need to do them for your homework. Okay, so the nucleus, um, that's Alice. So this one is near your diencephalon. Okay. Like I said, we don't know much about this, about how it plays a role in memory storage or retrieval, 
Uh, we pretty much know it's involved in that because once there's damage to it, this is how we figure everything out. So we knock it out or there's damage to it, and we're like, oh, that was important. That did this. Okay, so unless that happens, but trying to figure it out, I mean, how do you study this stuff without, you know, you can't really focus this on humans. So just have to wait till somebody gets brain damage. Okay. We know uh, damage in this area can change your emotional states, um, your memory, your intellectual functions. Cerebral cortex, so outside of your brain, long-term memories. Okay. So it can be conscious motor, it can be sensory motors, association, um, those, your occipital and temporal lobes. So these are things that help you remember faces, voices, names, Okay, so sometimes one cell might be activated by something, um, a scent, a look, um, something that triggers a memory. And sometimes they're called grandmother cells. Like if you smell banana bread and your grandma always makes banana bread, suddenly you're transported back to when you were five years old eating banana bread and you remember everything. This does not happen usually when we meet somebody. Five minutes later, we're like, who is that? <laughs> What's that person's name? Your cerebral cortex, also known as the cow. No. Uh, so, and this one, this is your visual association. So you can have a picture. You will associate the picture of this cow with the sound that it makes. It's moo. And you'll associate the letter C-O-W as the word cow. Your speech center will tell you that's how you say it. It's cow. Okay? And then your frontal lobe might tell you what they eat and that you would like yours not to have hormones in it or maybe you don't want to eat him. Whatever it is. Okay, so you're going to pull all these areas out of your cortex and put them all together, and you do it instantaneously. I'm sure nobody had to sit there and think, yeah, about this one. <laughs> so, how do we form memories? Okay, a couple things happen when we're converting from short to long term that we know of. Um, we increase neurotransmitter release. Okay, so I just saw the movie Limitless, and I'm pretty sure this is how it would work. Okay, so we just got to make that pill. Okay. We just have to increase neurotransmitter release. Um, facilitation at the synapses. Okay, so that means that um, synapses are flowing and we could have more connections. So more connections. That's when I tell you grow your dendrites, make them more connections so you can get into long term. So we can just figure out how to do this. You guys can memorize A and P in five weeks. So far not happening. What we know why repetition works is whenever you hit that pathway one time, you're going to release a little bit of neurotransmitter. You hit it again, you hit it again, you hit it again, you keep releasing a little bit more. Okay, so you have to activate the pathway to convert it from short to long term memories. Okay, so this is one thing. Um, facilitation. And you have to repeatedly keep stimulating that same pathway. And the only way to do this is repetition. So again, if you're cramming the night before a test, there's just not enough time to repeat it enough to get it to stick. Again, some of you are better at this than others, where you might have a really good short-term memory for 24 hours. Some people are not so good at this. But if you really need this information, you're going to have to put in a lot more effort. Okay. Right, more connections... So um, you lose, your neurons are actually in a little battle. When you're born and you're going through development, the neurons, you have way more neurons than you do now. So the ones you're using, they're the ones that survive. The ones that are not used um, will die and degrade. So lots of stimulation that happened when you were a child, those are the ones you've kept. You can't grow new neurons at this point, but you can make new connections. So what you're doing right now is really good for your brain. If you guys are in school and you're thinking and you're working and you're making those circuits do the job. When you get out of here and you get into a meaningful job or a meaningless job when you're like, this is all you do? Okay, there goes your brain. It's done. It's mushed. Do you notice now when they have all these puzzles, they have things you can buy? These are for people that sit at a computer all day like, <laughs> okay? You do not want those jobs because you do not use your brain. They're like, I don't know why my brain is mush. Because you don't use it. Okay, but... Hopefully, when you get out of here, all of you guys will have jobs where you actually get to think and challenge yourself so that you don't become that. Keep rolling your brain. Okay. 
so all these anatomical changes have to happen for you to actually get that memory to stick. Okay, so a memory engram, this is a single circuit that goes to a single memory. Okay, so one thing that you're going to remember, like the parasympathetic division only secretes acetylcholine, no matter what. Okay, repetition, repetition. They say seven times. You should watch a commercial and see how many times it plays in one show. Count it. Is it seven? They try, they try to get it in at least seven times. Did you ever see one that plays, then another one plays, and then it plays again? Like I'm John Silvers. I'm like, I hate this commercial. It's coming back. <laughs> hey, those people know what they're doing in advertisement. Songs, you know every word to probably every song in the top ten right now, whether you like it or not. You know it. Okay? <laughs> Painful. Okay, because you hear it so much. Okay, so it depends on the nature, the intensity, and the frequency. So of your original stimulus. So over and over and over. Intensity. Okay, things like this, if it's um whether it's a really good thing or it's a really bad thing, those tend to stick. Okay, so whenever you have a very strong emotional response, and here comes your limbic system, you're able to remember things and you store it much more rapidly. It's in there long term. Okay, so um, I don't know, maybe you should try do something painful while you study or something. <laughs> to help you remember. This is so painful. You're like, it's painful enough. But some way to trigger the emotion. Then you can trigger, I and mean, think about, go back in, in time in your brain and think about things that you really remember when you were very young. They were probably either super awesome, or that was the worst thing that ever happened to me. You won't forget it. Okay. Please, for the this. Visceral reflexes. They have the same components, right, as your somatic, but what about visceral that is different? They are all what? So, I'm not going to keep carrying your test back and forth, so if you didn't pick it up today, you have to come off with tomorrow. Just FYI. It just be a pain with all the cool stuff. And don't call me this week and say, I didn't pick up my test, can you send it? Nope, you should pick it up. So if you missed that question, there are many stages of this. So some of you were alert and awake and got that. Some of you were asleep and you missed that. Okay, so how wakeful depends on how much is going on in your CNS. So some of you need to rip it up. Okay. Uh, if it's abnormal, if it's if you're depressed, for some reason you can change and alter these states of wakefulness. Which makes sense. Usually people that are feeling a depression or having uh, problems with that don't have a lot of energy. Okay, let's talk about sleep. I know you don't remember. There's this thing called sleep. You guys haven't seen in a while. Deep sleep, which I know you haven't seen in a while. So this is the one where your body is relaxed. Your brain has really shut itself down, uh, at least the cortex. Okay, so your whole body, your heart rate, your breathing, your metabolism, and everything is going to sort of slow up. Your body's going to focus more on repair and division. Okay. This is non-REM sleep. It's called slow wave. REM sleep is, stands for rapid eye movement, which you guys probably all heard. This is when you're actively dreaming. Okay, so this is when you actually have brain activity up here. Not much going on up there. Here, um, you might have some changes in your blood pressure and your breathing. You're not receptive to outside stimuli, okay? So you are in the zone. When you're in a deep sleep, something, if somebody knocks something over, it might wake you up. If you're in REM, you're out. So you're in that dream stage. But different things are going on now in your body. Your muscle tone is active. Your heart might speed up. Um, 
you know, if some people, you should have inhibition of your somatic motor neurons, not always. Okay, so one thing that doesn't happen is your eyes aren't inhibited, which is why your eyes move. It's like you're awake. They're doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, so they're really moving. Okay, has anybody seen their dog or their cat running? <laughs> like, what are you doing? What are you chasing? Okay, so their motors they be like they're dreaming, but their their neurons are not inhibited. Anyone sleepwalk? No sleepwalkers? I was a classic sleepwalker. I'd be like down the street. <laughs> be like, but, so this is whenever you know some part of the brain that you're dreaming. It shouldn't be. You should not be walking around if it's turned on. And, uh, so yeah. So if you know anybody that does some weird things in their sleep, don't wake them up. By the way, learn that the hard way. Wake up in the middle of the street like what's going on? Okay. And whenever you're sleeping at night, you're you go through these cycles. Um, you start your deep sleep, you're in there for an hour or two, uh, and you're only going to have a short period of REM, okay? then you're going to go back into deep sleep. Then you have a longer period of REM, then back into deep sleep. If you wake up feeling exhausted, maybe you've had eight hours, but you, know, you just don't feel rested, you might have woken up, uh, your alarm went off when you were in the wrong stage, you weren't ready to come out of it just yet. Or maybe you had an hour and you feel like, ready to go. You never even hit REM if you're in that stage. You're going to crash later. Okay. So we know that sleep is very important for your central nervous system. We know when you don't sleep, you do weird things like put your car keys in the refrigerator and the coffee pot on the table over there. You, you don't remember things. Um, we don't know the science behind it. Like everyone knows. Oh, well, yeah, sleep's important. You don't feel right, but physiologically, what's happening? We know your cells are repaired, but why is it so important for your? Why can't you function? You can't function when you're not sleeping. Right? So, we know extended period leads to disturbances in mental function. Case in point, our test yesterday. Okay? So, I'm sure none of you are on normal sleep patterns right now, right? Are any of you? No? I didn't think so. So, 25% will experience sleep disorders on a regular basis. I'm assuming they're not calling or including any college children because that would be like 75%. This is um, when we're looking at your brain waves. Here's you awake, pretty active. This is deep sleep, so it's slow waves. You sort of, your brain's settled down, but here's REM. Okay, now you didn't want to be in REM for eight straight hours, right? That wouldn't be a good thing because you know, it's too much activity. So you have these little portions. Did you ever notice how you have these dreams that one day you're, you're one part you're in the library and then suddenly you're outside at the beach but the same people were there. It's like, how does that happen? <laughs> They're probably linking together different sections. So it's been six hours, but to you, those link right together. Like, how did so-and-so get here suddenly? Or they morph into another person. <laughs> brain does their thing. I thought that was Joe, now it's Susie. Like, what's <laughs> Yeah, so that just sort of shows you. So arousal, or your state of wakefulness, um, has a lot to do with your reticular activating system, the RAS, which we talked about. It's in your brainstem, that little nuclei, that mass that extends from your brainstem. So it goes all the way from your medulla up to your mesencephalon. So we know that the RAS has a, a big influence on this, and it will project to the thalamic nuclei, um, which will talk to your cerebral cortex, so those filters. So pretty much when you're in the sleepful state, the thalamus is going to pull everything in and say, okay, we don't need to send all this information to the brain right now. When you're wakeful, all that information is going through. Some of you are not getting so much information right now. Okay. So RAS is inactive, your cortex is inactive, you're in a more sleepful state. Okay. This is sort of the link all the way up. Huntington's disease. Um, so we're sort of switching gear now. Any questions on consciousness, sleep, memories? It's kind of neat stuff, right? If you remember it. Okay. Huntington's is um, a genetic disease. It's a recessive disease. Um, somatic recessive disease. This is whenever you have your acetylcholine um, secreting cells or your GABA secreting cells are sort of destroyed in your basal um, nuclei in your cerebrum. 
So um, they start degenerating, and this is a, probably if you had me in 1441, we talked about this, but this is one it doesn't hit you. Uh, did I, this is a, not a recessive. This is a dominant disease. I'm sorry. But uh, it doesn't hit you till you're older in life, like 40, 50, 60. There's no real time. But once it happens, it's just a progressive degeneration of your movements. So um, it eventually, your intellectual abilities will also decline. You'll be in a wheelchair. And we now know the genetic basis of it, but we don't know how to cure this. Lysergic acid diethylamine, otherwise known as LSD. This one is a drug um, that affects your sensory interpretation okay, and your emotional state. So the reason for this is it's binding to your serotonin receptor. So those are your, your happy feelings. So in your brainstem, your hypothalamus, and your limbic system. So if you like Jim Morrison and all that stuff, they used to think that LSD was uh, open up your brain, open up the doors to reception, which is where you get the doors from. Everything in music and drugs and all. So, um, when you're depressed, this is a, a factor of that can be that you're not producing enough serotonin, or for some reason, maybe you don't have the receptors for serotonin. So, a lot of the antidepressants that we see on the market today, their job is to increase um, the amount of serotonin left in that synapse so you can keep firing. It's not degraded right away. So, you can maintain that elevation of that feel good emotional state. I say, why not just give them the rest <laughs> I bet you they would be cured faster. That or you'd go crazy. <laughs> Parkinson disease. This is one with dopamine. So um, dopamine is involved in our motor controls. This is also sort of a feel-good one. If you take speed, um, you know, crystal meth or amphetamines, this one will stimulate dopamine production. Uh, and when you have super large doses of this, that's when you start to exhibit the same symptoms as schizophrenia. So it's kind of interesting that we can take these mental illnesses and your state of awareness on drugs and be like, hey, they're the same. I don't know why you'd want to take these things. So this is when uh, you start to really you hear things, you hallucinate things, you see a lot of things going on that aren't real. That doesn't happen to people with Parkinson's. Right, that's different. That's the one we were talking about where, um, in that case, they don't actually have enough dopamine. Okay? In that case, um, dopamine for them would inhibit those excitatory neurons for the motor skills. And when that stops, that's when they lose sort of their control a little bit. Aging. Let's see if we're going to talk about this. We can talk a little bit about this. Um, it's not gonna, I'm probably not going to test you about aging. Okay. So pretty much... The reason I don't like this is because I'm over 30 and everything in the book is like, once you hit 30, you're going downhill. <laughs> what? I'm like, I'm not teaching this, I'm not teaching that. I'm like, <laughs> forget that. We're going to say 60. That keeps me safe for a few years. So they say, um, over time, obviously you get older. We know your body breaks down. Not at 30. But your brain will actually start shrinking a little bit. You'll lose some brain weight. So um, your diary will become more narrow. Your sulking will get wider. More subarachnoid space. Okay, not really good. Your neurons will start dying. Okay, so that's not good. Um, you'll have less blood flow to your brain. This can actually be um, just like in your heart, arteriosclerosis, when you have less blood flow. It can happen in your brain, too, from fat deposits. You might have damage. You can have a blood vessel that um, can burst. You can have a stroke where you're not having blood to the brain. Okay. You'll lose your synaptic connections. Okay. And then we know um, there's different things that can happen associated with diseases. You can have these neurofibular tangles. This is when we have excess proteins and different things that shouldn't be there are now being produced. So the whole cellular physiological environment just isn't maintained as well as it should be. So that's when we get uh, all these proteins and different things in there that inhibit your normal brain function. But uh, we know all this. Yeah, I know. I'm going to lose my hearing. Really. I've already lost my hearing. Senality. Um, so dementia and Alzheimer's are not the same thing. 
Okay, before you get Alzheimer's, you can become um, senile and start the beginning stages of dementia, which is when you start to lose your memory. Now, you're all experiencing that right now, I'm sure, because your brains are overlaid with A and P information. You are not going senile. You are fine. Okay. But uh, you might not store new memories. You might forget different things. Alzheimer's is the very end of that. That's when you get to the point where you've really forgotten um, a lot of basic your own children. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Any questions? No. All right. You guys did good today. Chapter 17.